Can everybody hear me okay? Cool. Okay, um, I'm Arlie Edelin. I'm a postdoc at Slack, and I'm going to try to give you a high level overview of machine learning applications for particle accelerators and also give you some background on various techniques that can be used in this context. So, um, first, it's, it's useful to sort of cut through some of the jargon. So, oftentimes, uh, a lot of these words will get thrown around, and uh, they actually do mean something. So, uh, I'll try to give you a little bit of a, a perspective on um, at least how uh, it seems most people tend to interpret each of these. So, um, overall, you have this large uh, field of artificial intelligence, and really, this is generally concerned with um, figuring out ways of enabling machines to exhibit aspects of intelligence. Now, that's extremely broad, and um, within that, you have a lot of different sub-areas. Uh, mostly, today, what you hear about are um, machine learning applications that are focused on uh, really narrow, uh, so-called narrow AI, so on very specific tasks. Um, so, before we get to machine learning specifically, I want to put it into the context of mathematical optimization, which we're much more familiar with than particle accelerators. So, in general, uh, you can have these techniques that uh, sort of are just based on um, estimates of how uh, some function that you want to optimize is changing based on the inputs. So, you can do that by approximating the gradient, for example. Um, when you start to get more into uh, artificial intelligence is where you start to uh, uh, pull inspiration from uh, complicated uh, systems in nature. So, for instance, uh, evolutionary algorithms and uh, swarm intelligence sort of uh, are taking insights from um, how uh, swarms behave and how uh, evolution occurs um, to try to come up with a better way of moving toward an optimum but you're not actually learning any uh, representation of the system uh, when you're doing this. So when you start to get into machine learning, uh, you're actually, uh, as you go along, learning something about the underlying system behavior. So that's the distinction there. And within machine learning, um, you know, typically you're trying to uh, figure out how to complete some specific task without explicitly telling uh, the program how to, program how to do it. So uh, this encompasses a variety of tasks, including things like regression, uh, classifying different objects, things like this. Um, within machine learning, you have uh, neural networks. And this is really just one particular tool. Um, and itself, is, this itself is quite broad. So the, at the highest level, uh, when you're talking about neural networks, you're just talking about um, using many uh, different individual functions that are then connected together, and that's used to process input-output data. Um, and then within neural networks, you have this uh, term deep learning. Uh, right now, this is pretty synonymous with just using uh, deep, i.e. many-layered neural networks. But the underlying thing that you're getting at here is that you're learning hierarch hierarchical representations of the data. Um, so this is sort of my attempt to to maybe elucidate some of the jargon for you. Um, so neural networks specifically, uh, I will just go over very briefly because most people want to hear about them. Um, in essence, uh, all you're doing is stringing together lots of these processing functions, which are then parameterized by weights. So for instance, you have, if you have some inputs, uh, these get sent to this function, um, and uh, this weight uh, is uh, used to modify this input. And then you put many of these things together, and you end up with something called a feed-forward network in the case where you're just going straight from the input to the output in the forward direction. And then if you make other kinds of connections, like connecting a node back on itself, you end up with a recurrent neural network, for example. Um, there are a lot of architectures. Uh, if you want to sort of find more examples of uh, names of architectures to uh, be a jumping off point to look into more detail, this neural network zoo website, which is linked here, um, has, has a lot of that in kind of a nice graphical form. Um, so just to give an example of how the learning process actually works, uh, this is really just an optimization problem. So you have all of these individual parameters of the network that you can adjust, not just these weights, but also the number of nodes, connections between nodes. 
Um, and if you have a bunch of data, uh, oh, and typically this, this function here, uh, you have to choose uh, what you want to use. So in this case, I'm showing a TANH activation function. Um, there are a bunch of different ones that you can pick depending on your problem. Um, and in essence, what you end up doing is just taking some input data. It goes through some realistic uh, process that you're trying to emulate, for instance. Uh, you send this to the neural network model as well. And in initially, it'll give some totally random output because you randomly initialize all these weights. And then um, you look at the difference between uh, the predicted output and the real output. Uh, you do an optimization step. Uh, in this case, you, know, you could just use simple gradient descent, which is in practice um, uh, what is often used for neural nets in various forms. And then you just iterate on this until you've reached some acceptable level of convergence. Um, and stepping back a little bit more uh, into machine learning in general, uh, there are also a few different learning paradigms. So what I just described to you was an example of supervised learning where you have known input-output pairs that you are trying to mimic. Uh, you can also have unsupervised learning where you don't have any um, uh, labeled data. So for instance, maybe you just have um, a bunch of raw data and you're trying to group it into similar sort of clusters, for instance. So you're trying to infer something from the data itself. And then you also have reinforcement learning. And in this case, uh, you might have uh, uh, some agent interacting with an environment. And then you get some feedback from the environment depending on your behavior. And then maybe you'll adjust your behavior afterward. So that's, this is, in essence, uh, the, the main idea behind reinforcement learning. In the context of neural nets, uh, this sort of maps together in the following way. You have some task that you want to uh, solve with machine learning. Uh, this helps inform you know, which kind of learning paradigm you want to use to help solve it. If you've chosen a neural network um, to use as the way that you want to solve this, uh, then you use mathematical optimization to adjust all the weights of the neural net. This is just one example. So if you want more information on neural networks specifically, uh, for the last ICFA ML workshop for particle accelerators, we put together a nice set of slides and also some tutorial notebooks in Python. Uh, so I encourage you to go look at that. But really what I want to do is give you a broader view of how ML can be useful for accelerators and including other techniques that are really valuable but a little less hyped than neural networks at the moment. Um, and so more broadly, uh, you know, th this question comes up a lot. Why, why the sudden interest in machine learning? And really it comes down to a variety of different factors. So uh, one of the major ones is that we now have uh, greatly increased compute capability. Uh, so this both allows you to handle um, much larger data sets, uh, and it allows you to um, train uh, more complicated neural net architectures, for instance. Uh, we also have um, new uh, neural network uh, architectures, such as long short-term memory networks. This is an LSTM cell. And then generative adversarial networks. Um, these are pretty powerful uh, new kinds of architectures. Um, and these open up uh, additional applications uh, that we can apply neural networks to. It's also much easier to share large data sets now uh, than it has been in the past. And it's easier than ever to just log on to you know, some Amazon cloud services or Google Colaboratory and try training on some data sets. Um, and then we're also having, uh, we have specialized hardware. So, uh, GPUs are, are um, extremely uh, uh, easy to access now. Uh, there are also uh, newer, newer hardware architectures like neuromor neuromorphic chips and tensor processing units, which are coming out. And then uh, there have also been a lot of um, uh, actual theoretical advancements in uh, trying to understand um, how best to optimize different kinds of neural net architectures. Um, what's actually going on uh, when you apply different kinds of optimization algorithms to this task of optimizing the weights. And then finally, uh, because there have been a lot of uh, real-world application attempts, um, this also has helped to drive a lot of algorithmic advancement. And so this is an iterative process uh, back and forth between real-world applications and um, algorithmic development. And for us in particular, uh, 
we're also getting better at a lot of these things. So for instance, uh, because we have a greater capability now to save more data, like more image data, for instance, uh, we're expanding uh, that source of additional data. And then we're also getting better at modeling accelerators. So for instance, uh, we can run a lot of uh, modeling codes in parallel um, at, on uh, high performance computing systems. Uh, we also um, have uh, um, uh, a greater ability to include, for example, a greater number of particles in the bunch when we're doing simulations, things like this. Um, so this goes hand in hand with sort of what's going on more broadly in machine learning. Um, why do we care? Uh, particle accelerators um, are really difficult to model and control in many cases, especially if you have really, a really large machine, for instance, uh, like LCLS, 1.7 kilometers long. Um, and in addition to this, you know, these systems can be quite complex. And what I mean by that is that you have some nonlinear behavior, you have a really large parameter space, uh, you can have a lot of small compounding errors that end up making a big difference in the end. Uh, and we also have a lot of interacting subsystems. So like there's an RF control system that's separate maybe from a lot of the um, uh, beam feedback systems, with the trajectory control. Uh, we also have a lot of diagnostics that aren't really put to full use. So inst for instance, someone can look at the longitudinal phase space and uh, make some adjustments uh, to settings based on that. But um, we don't have a lot of feedback algorithms looking directly at those images. Um, and we also have a lot of time-varying, non-stationary behavior. So oftentimes we'll just call this drift. But um, in essence, uh, those, are, those are sort of what makes these uh, interesting systems to apply machine learning to. Uh, we also have a really strong need to improve um, both uh, our understanding of these systems and um, improve control over them. So for instance, uh, at, L at LCLS, we have really high user demand, and we want to spend as little as time possible switching between custom user requests. Uh, we also um, have a high cost uh, for unintended downtime, so if there's a failure of some kind because uh, something wasn't properly controlled and you got a runaway trip, um, this is really going to reduce the overall scientific output of the facility. Uh, and beyond that, we also... Um, want to actually be able to provide new capabilities to the users. So as, as we're doing that, uh, we end up with uh, needing finer and finer control requirements, or we're making you know, LCLS, for instance, do uh, more um, uh, crazy gymnastics. Um, so, and, and this is all just going to get um, more complicated as we start to adopt uh, novel acceleration schemes, uh, like uh, plasma-based acceleration. And then as we start to turn on um, machines like LCLS2 with SRF. Uh, we also spend a lot of time during tuning. Um, uh, this is uh, from actual data at LC LCLS. I'm just going to start going through these pretty quickly. In essence, we can look at um, how operators tune the machine to get some inspiration about what techniques might be useful. So for instance, they're doing diagnostic analysis, looking at images. They're learning um, some uh, mental model of the system based on their understanding of the physics and by looking at the machine. They're also doing some um, uh, learning of control policies, so mapping what they're seeing to appropriate changes in controllable settings to make. Uh, they're doing um, feedback and optimization themselves by doing fine tuning. Um, and this all maps into uh, things that we can start uh, applying ML to. So the major use cases really are um, trying to automatically detect uh, um, unwanted changes in the machine, um, also do failure prediction, um, getting more out of the signals that we have um, coming from the machine. Uh, we also can use this to enhance system control and optimization. We also can use it to try to make faster executing, more accurate system models. And then we can also actually use it to improve our understanding of how the machine is operating. So I'll give examples of these. Um, for, in the first case, uh, for anomaly detection, uh, this is where you're trying to figure out, um, uh, you're trying to detect when a change has occurred. Uh, it's usually a bad change. So in this case, um, we're trying to identify some bad BPM signals because you don't want to then go and use those BPM signals when you're trying to do some 
derived optics measurement or if you're trying to make a correction based on that. So there are a lot of techniques that are already in use for this sort of thing, like singular value de decomposition, um, and that's effective, but it doesn't remove all the bad signals. So um, uh, Elena Full and some other folks uh, have um, tried using uh, clustering algorithms uh, for the LHC BPMs to try to test out doing an anomaly detection for this application. And uh, what they've found is that uh, if they compare um, normal uh, SVD uh, with doing SVD and then this step with a clustering algorithm called an isolation forest, they can end up um, throwing away m many more of the bad BPM signals, which are shown in blue here. And so this results in a much more accurate um, uh, uh, beta beating um, result when they go to use those bad BPMs uh, to actually compute this value. So um, they also, oops, sorry. They also um, uh, uh, have some bulk results that they reported. So you can see SVD gets rid of a lot of the BPMs, but then this isolation forest technique removes uh, most of the rest of those. And then they've also compared some different methods, and uh, there's some trade-off to be made here between um, how, how many uh, BPMs you want to throw away uh, based on the size of your machine. So maybe uh, in some case, like the DB scan, uh, you might want to use that if you want to keep more of your BPM data. But at a large facility like the LHC, maybe you don't care if you throw away some BPM signals that are good, which is the difference between the, um, the dark shade and the light shade here. Um, we also, in accelerators, have a lot of really complicated diagnostic output that we don't put to full use. So for instance, we have beam images, we have um, time series data, and ML can be used to extract more information from these more quickly as well. And can I ask um, one question? Yeah. Um, so if you, you think you are removing bad BPMs with this process, but are there any cases that might happen? There's unique new problems happen in the beam, and, and somehow you not recognizing because I don't know what exactly I'm saying, but if you are so relying on more standard behaviors, if there's a new problems occur, is there any danger of not catching that early enough? Um, for, for these specific algorithms, potentially, however, they are training on really large amounts of historical data. So they've probably you know, reduce the risk of that sort of thing happening. But, I mean, that, I mean that's a concern with any right. ML technique. So the beam situation is always we are going more intense, or it's different yeah. configurations. So if the new problems occur because you, know, you have yeah. different conditions, then you probably lose that. Right, and I'll, I'll comment on that a little bit later as well. So if you're trying to look at all of this complicated diagnostic output, um, neural nets are a really useful tool for this. So for instance, um, at LCLS, uh, we have uh, this longitudinal phase-based diagnostic. Um, and uh, this is used by the users uh, to get um, information about the photon beam. So uh, before lasing occurs, you have the electron beam. And then after lasing, the electron beam has given up some energy to the photons. And so you get this difference between these two images, which is then uh, used with a, an iterative reconstruction technique to get the X-ray power profile. However, this is slow, and it also doesn't work well in all the regimes. So for instance, when you get it deep into saturation, you can start to get uh, some curvature here that um, it can't actually be picked up by uh, the state-of-the-art um, reconstruction algorithm that's used. So instead, uh, if you can look at this whole image directly, um, you can do a reconstruction of the X-ray power profile and do it much more accurately and much faster than you could with this iterative reconstruction technique. So the iterative uh, technique is shown in blue. And then the uh, uh, convolutional neural net, in this case, uh, gave the prediction that is in red. And the actual ground truth with, with, with respect to what we can measure on the TCAV is shown in green, and it's a little bit hard to see because it overlaps almost exactly with the red curve. 
Um, related to this, uh, some diagnostics are destructive to the beam. So for instance, if you insert a slit into the beam um, and then you're looking at this image to reconstruct part of the phase space, uh, you can't use it downstream. Uh, and this, this sort of thing can also be slow. So the question is, can you instead use um, non-intercepting non uh, readings from upstream to predict what this diagnostic would show? Um, and the way that this works is you take all those measurements, you take a bunch of samples from the actual diagnostic, and then you train a machine learning model to then instead predict that output. And then when this diagnostic is no longer available, you can still you do everything that you normally would with this diagnostic prediction, so including feedback, user analysis, et cetera. Um, so this works. Uh, we tried this out um, at FAST for this multi-slit uh, example. Uh, but this is also not just useful for destructive measurements. You can use it in other cases as well. So for instance, at LCLS, uh, we have um, LCLS2, we have, an, we have an XTCAV as well. But the beam rate is going to be 1 megahertz, and the XTCAV only updates at 120 hertz. So if we can fill in uh, information in between the actual XTCAV update rates, we could then give that information to the users. And there's some uh, initial work that's been done uh, that's shown that you can at least do this for um, predicting uh, this, the derived scalar outputs that you get from, uh, from the XTCAV. And then we have also done some work um, both in simulation of FACET2, which is another, is, uh, another machine that's going to be built at Slack, and we did an experimental study at LCLS um, where we varied just a couple of parameters and tried to see if we could predict uh, what the longitudinal phase space would look like. And both of these look encouraging. So these are initial studies, but it looks like we should be able to use this technique uh, for these applications. Um, in terms of uh, doing diagnostic analysis, you can also look at waveform data. Uh, so this was a nice example from Anna Solopova at IPAC, where uh, she used to painstakingly go through uh, all of this data and then advise about uh, adjustments that uh, needed to be made uh, to the operators. Uh, but instead, if you use automatic classification for this, uh, now you have all this uh, data that you're um, reading in and, and uh, putting into different categories that can then, um, uh, someone can then look at to try to figure out you know, what are different sources of trips, uh, how effective are different recovery, recovery strategies, things like this. Um, and it also provides a quick indication to someone in the control room uh, about how they should respond to this particular trip. Um, and they looked at a variety of trip kinds of trip classifiers, um, and the, the main takeaway here is that there's this trade-off between feature engineering, interpretability, and the amount of data that you have. So you can use deep learning, where you don't have to do any feature engineering, um, but you do need a lot of data for this. Um, and there are some packages already, like TS Fresh, uh, that do some automatic feature selection, and these results still give these uh, approaches still give really good results, and they're quite simple. You also um, uh, get some nice perks. Uh, for example, if you use a decision tree, uh, you get uh, feature importance out of it automatically. So this can tell you that you know, these two um, parameters mattered a lot more for, towards the prediction. Um, in terms of control and tuning, um, I alluded to this sort of um, uh, iterative uh, type of optimization earlier that we're all very familiar with, where you estimate some change uh, in the cost function based on, um, uh, you estimate the gradient based on that change based on some input uh, adjustments to the input, um, and you uh, calculate a change based on that, and then you repeat this until it converges. Uh, some advantages to this is that it's simple and really fast to implement but you can get stuck in local minima. Uh, oftentimes, think this, this kind of approach is not very noise, noise robust, and because you're doing this iterative process where you have to take a lot of samples, uh, it can be really slow to converge. Um, in terms of uh, evolutionary algorithms and swarm intelligence, uh, the way that this sort of thing works is um, these are all population-based approaches where you make a lot of candidate solutions, you evaluate them, you update them based on some rules. So in a GA, it's this crossover and mutation operation and then selection. And then you repeat. Um, the advantage here is that you can get to a global optima uh, more, optimum more easily, uh, but it's very expensive. You have to make a lot of func function calls, either to um, some uh, 
uh, simulation or uh, to some actual uh, live system. Instead, uh, you can also use machine learning to explore some learned representation uh, of the system to actually inform where to look next. So this includes things like Bayesian optimization, deep reinforcement learning, and model predictive control. Um, this can be pretty efficient, and you can get to global optima pretty easily. Um, but uh, there is a development overhead, uh, and a lot of times you'll lose interpretability depending on what kind of ML approach you are using. Um, I do want to highlight Bayesian optimization, which is um, really applicable to a lot of different kinds of problems. So you start by building a probabilistic model based on some appropriate choice of a kernel function uh, that you expect to kind of look like your system behavior. And then out of this, uh, you learn a bunch of functions based on a few samples. And then you wind up in the end with this prediction uncertainty as well as um, the predicted output value based on some input variables. And then you can iteratively refit this model as you go along, and then use the model predictions and the uncertainty prediction to guide uh, where to sample next. So the way that this actually works in practice is uh, you have some trade-off between um, exploiting what you've already learned about the system and exploring new parts of the system. And this gets codified in an acquisition function, which um, you are, in, in which case you're trying to find uh, some value x that maximizes uh, your objective function output um, and then uh, also uh, maximizes this um, beta parameter, which you can use to tune this trade-off, uh, um, multiplied by the standard deviation of, this, of, uh, of the function output. So then uh, this, this particular acquisition fa function is called the upper confidence bound, and it's shown in, in green here. So in this case, um, you've sampled these points that are shown in X. Um, you have the mean of the model shown in blue. You have your true uh, function shown in red. And then uh, based on all of this information and the up upper confidence bound, you pick this point to sample next. And the way that this uh, proceeds in practice is you'll sample a few points. You'll decide to sample that next point, And then you keep going like this, and then eventually you'll have reduced your um, model uncertainty, and you can tune this beta parameter um, uh, so that effectively what you're doing is raising this green curve up or down. So in, in the extreme cases, if you have um, uh, decided that you mainly just want to exploit knowledge uh, that you've uh, gained already, uh, you might uh, not explore the parameter space as fully. So maybe you get here, and then because uh, this, um, uh, you're not willing to explore over here, you've missed this optimum. Um, but if you uh, emphasize the exploration too much, uh, you might just end up with uniform sampling, uh, where you're just sort of not really taking advantage of the fact that you have this model. Um, you can also inject some physics into this. So for instance, at LCLS, we're trying to maximize the FEL pulse energy. So you can um, take some information that you have from basic accelerator physics about how adjacent quadrupoles should be correlated with FEL power. And you can actually put this into the kernel. Oh, these are not showing up there. OK. So if um, this is the actual uh, ground truth of how this particular system behaves, and you train it with just a normal RBF kernel um, using various sample points of the space, uh, you won't end up with a very good uh, representation just on these samples. But if you instead have sort of encoded this um, uh, prior about how this thing should behave into the, uh, into the kernel, and you regress on the same samples, you end up with a much more accurate representation. Um, and we know at LCLS in practice that this works better than simplex, for instance. And then if you compare the GP with the GP with correlations, you uh, converge faster and you get to a higher FEL pulse energy. But in practice, um, we have other requirements. We don't just want to maximize FEL energy. Uh, if the pulse energy drops below a certain level, we have angry users. If the beam losses go above a certain threshold, we'll damage the machine. So we want to add these kinds of requirements as safety constraints 
And this has been tested at ETH Zurich and experimented, test, sorry, it's been tested at Swissfell. Um, it was developed by folks at AT ETH Zurich. So this is showing a comparison between an algorithm that does not have these safety constraints and an algorithm that has the safety constraints included, so you don't get these dropouts quite as much. Um, and I can stop it here if I'm out of time. So anyway, the, the, uh, I'll just briefly um, maybe switch to some final thoughts. I spent a lot more time in the introduction than I had intended. Oops. Okay, there's some delay, so it's now going through all of the backup slides. Okay, I didn't get to show you some nice examples uh, that also uh, demonstrate how uh, you can take a machine learning model and give it a bunch of archive data and then learn about sensitivities about the real machine, which is sort of interesting. Um, but we can talk about that offline if you're interested. Um, overall, uh, there are a lot of different techniques that you can choose from when you want to try to tackle these various problems. Um, but there are a lot of really simple methods that work very well and are pretty easy to implement. Overall, um, there, there are a lot of open questions still about where uh, the limits of these various techniques are. So with neural networks in particular, um, they're not as robust as many simpler techniques. Guaranteeing robustness for them um, is, is, is uh, difficult, so uh, we have to sort of just empirically test where they're going to be most applicable and useful and how to make them more reliable. And then um, there's also uh, this, this question about how much uh, investment do you want to put into developing these approaches. Um, so the, the example um, from Anna uh, at IPAC um, uh, really highlights the fact that, uh, you know, if you put some effort into uh, gathering the training data, uh, you can end up with a really nice, um, uh, fast uh, system in the end that then frees up uh, um, operators and also machine physicists to uh, do more uh, useful things with their time. So I'll just... Uh, go through this here. So she had this description of um, her daily routine before implementing this um, uh, classifier uh, for the SRF waveforms. So she, she had to do a lot of work just trying to manually go through logbook entries to figure out what happened, uh, try to convince um, operators uh, when, and when it was or wasn't appropriate to reduce the accelerating gradient. And her comment was, I want my life back. So um, she spent a lot of time uh, manually gathering the training data and labeling it. Um, but in the end, they now have a system that works pretty well for classifying these faults. And then as part of that, they've opened up um, this whole new uh, data set to look at um, actual like more fundamental questions about how they can make the cryo modules better, where these faults come from, and also um, what approaches are going to work best for um, uh, compensating for these sorts of faults when they occur. And uh, her comment was, I sort of got my life back. So um, this is just, I think, a nice example that is in stark contrast to you know, the general gloom and doom about uh, oh, is it ever going to be worth it to invest all of this time and effort um, into developing these methods? And is AI coming from my job? Um, in, in reality, it'll probably help you do more interesting things by freeing up your time. So I'll close with that. Okay, we have time for a couple of very quick questions. Yes. Um, I was um, just confused about your classification of uh, mathematical optimization and uh, how, how it, like, it didn't include neural nets. Because when you explain the neural net, you were doing an optimization problem, still it seemed. 
So yeah. I wanted to know what you really mean by math ma mathematical optimization versus what you're actually doing in the learning. Yeah. So so in that in that particular slide, um, actually, I, I'm not going to click through it because it's going to take too long. Um, but uh, really what I was getting at there is what kind of problem you're trying to solve. And in reality, you can use a neural net and reinforcement learning to try to solve some optimization problem. Um, but in, in, uh, in terms of uh, grouping these things into uh, sort of where they fall within um, AI versus machine learning, that was the main thing that I was trying to convey there. So you're right. The lines are a little bit blurrier. You could use a neural net to do mathematical optimization in that you are adapting the weights of the neural net to then make it more suitable in the case of neural net reinforcement learning to um, uh, go to better uh, optima on some system that you're having this neural net control. So it's a little bit nuanced.